بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحادينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا حبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العربي بأب القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أحل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذنومين المنتجبين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق والأسدق القائلين نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني إنها إن تكم قال حبة من خردل فتكن في سخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأت بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانهى عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Over the course of the last several weeks we've been taking a look at Surah Luqman which is chapter 31 of the whole of Quran and last week we arrived at the conclusion of verse number 15 and just as a quick recap from where we left off last uh, week, we took a look at these two verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Luqman's advice to his son, reminding him about his responsibilities to his parents. And we took a look at these descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers with regards to this incredibly stern reminder about how we should engage with our parents. And we concluded, at least in the Q&A, with various questions around whether or not our parents are abusive to us and what are our responsibilities uh, in cases like those, and what is the boundary of respect and at least a show of love or adoration uh, to our parents. Just as a quick recap, we go toward these verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, he states, وَوَسَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ فَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا عَلَىٰ وَحْنًا وَفِسَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ he states, first of all, that we are advising you pertaining to your parents. And perhaps, again, he is quoting Luqman, who is telling his son. And we are advising you specifically with regards to your mother, who carried you upon great difficulty and great difficulty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats this phrase two times. Wahnan ala wahnan. fi amain. And in addition to that, she nursed you. Anishkur li wali walidayk. So offer gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time offer gratitude to your parents. Ilayya al-masir. And your return is back to me. Wa in jahadaka ala an tushrik bi ma laysa laka bihi ilmun fala tata'huma wa sahibhuma fi dunya ma'rufa. And I want to just recap with this particular phrase just so that we're able to close out where we concluded last week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 15 he states that in terms of your relationship with them in this dunya, in spite of the fact that they may have been, for instance, abusive, that they may have transgressed their own boundaries and the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in spite of the fact that they may not have fulfilled their rights as parents to the child, Allah still gives this very firm reminder and command in the whole of Quran. What is it? وَسَاهِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا At the very least, keep a good companionship with them in dunya. And like we mentioned, most of our scholars of Islamic law, as well as through a deduction of numerous ahadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, consistently demonstrate that the onus of responsibility in at the very least reaching out and trying toward curating a meaningful relationship with our parents, even if they have cut us out, is to at least extend our hand. That is the responsibility of a child over us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed with regards to how we should maintain respect and honor with our parents, even if they reject. You know, we're at the end of the holy month of Ramadan. And tomorrow night will be the night of Eid al-Fitr. And even if it means that you just send one text message, you make one phone call, it doesn't matter if they don't pick up. You send an email, it doesn't matter if you, somebody came to me, many, many people came to me after last 
uh, week's discussion, last Thursday's discussion, and they said, for instance, I've not spoken to my parents in years. My parents don't respond to my phone call. They're this, they're that. Even if it means that we extend by sending a message or an email, Eid Mubarak, at the very least, we're demonstrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we tried. We are a servant of Allah more than anything else. That's what we actualize during the course of these nights and days during the holy month of Ramadan. We're the servant of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do something. We might not like it. It might seem a bit burdensome for us. But at the end of the day, we need to demonstrate to the best of our ability that we are fulfilling our notion of subservience and servitude and submission to the Lord of the worlds. And when Allah Azza wa Jal, He states that extend your hand and at the very least, do your best to curating some sort of meaningful relationship with your parents. And that's what it means. And if you already have one, then it means that even extend it even further toward demonstrating even more love, even more grace, even in whatever way that you can. There's no black and white. There's no this is the solution and this is the uh, prescription with regards to how to engage your parents. We come from different communities. We come from different cultures. We grew up in different ways. Some people, when they greet their parents, they hug them and they kiss them. Some, they shake their hand. Some, they give them a wave. I don't know. Everyone has their own relationship on the basis of how they were raised and on the basis of their culture, on the basis of their community, um, and certain rituals or customs that they engage in. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us this notion of flexibility in our, um, uh, in, in, in our religious tradition. We apply the arf in this regard. If, for instance, showing love and affection to your parents on the day of Eid is to give them a gift, then that's the attempt you make. If it's to, I don't know, uh, go and visit them in their home, then that's what you do. If it's to go and visit their grave, if they've passed, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon all of our deceased, then that's what we do. And it suffices, again, that we put forth our best effort in this regard. And as we said before, as a segue into this next set of verses, these advices that Luqman is giving to his son, we stated in, uh, in our previous discussions that seemingly Luqman's son was a disbeliever, someone who was totally absent toward any awareness of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't care, or even worse, he might have even been a pagan, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, uh, quoting Luqman, وَلَا تُشْرِكْ billah, Make sure that you're not someone who attributes partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And over here, the first piece of advice after believing in God that Luqman gives his son is the advice of making sure that he fulfills his duties and responsibilities to his parents. Again, with incredible weight in the language, we spoke about that uh, last week. Then Luqman, he gets to the next set of advices as we've been taking a look at in verses number 16 and 17 that we want to take a glance at today. In verse number 16, again, for those of you who want to follow chapter 31 of the Quran, Surah Luqman, verse number 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, Ya bunayya, innaha in takum mithqala habbatin min khardal, fatakun fi sakhratin, o fi samawati, o fi al-ard, ya'ti biha Allah, inna Allah latifun khadir. This is really beautiful. He states, oh my dear son, remember when we said that Luqman, he addresses his son, Ya bunayya, it's a, it's a term of affection, right? Oh my, oh my beloved, you are the love of my life. Oh my son, again, this son was a disbeliever. He was someone who was disrespectful to Luqman and disrespectful to the God of Luqman. Yet, even then, Luqman demonstrates the way that he would speak to his son. Ya Bunayya. And again, Allah loves this example so much that he places it in the Quran. Ya Bunayya. Innaha in taku mithqala habbatin min kharda. He said, imagine, oh my dear son, that there was a mustard seed something very, very insignificant in terms of its weight, in terms of its measure, something virtually microscopic. Now imagine that this little microscopic seed was in a really massive boulder, in a massive rock. In the Arabic language, the word sakhra is a really large rock like half of the size of this room, for instance, like a boulder. Imagine that this little tiny seed was present in this rock. What is it going to take for us to find that seed? Has anyone like lost some piece of jewelry or someone lost something like very meaningful to them that is very small? And how like crazy do we go toward finding it? You lost it in the living room. It went into your couch. When someone loses the remote, it's actually large and it goes and stuck, gets stuck inside the couch. Our phone drops in there. We lose our mind. We lose our mind. Over here he says, imagine 
there's this mustard seed, and it's in the, this rock. What, what do we have to do? We have to take this rock, get some hammers, start cutting it out, breaking it out, and still, what are the chances that we're going to be able to find it? Like, what's the smallest coin? A dime. Imagine we all had to get up right now, and there's a dime in the corner of this prayer room somewhere. More likely than not, even though we're however many people we are in this room, how long would it take to find it? We wouldn't, we wouldn't find it right away. It's small, it's tiny, right? We'd be looking in this corner, looking in this corner, maybe there's dust around it, maybe the prayer mat is on it, maybe, I don't know what, maybe it's, maybe it's under someone's cup or under someone's water bottle, under someone's phone. It takes effort to it identifying where this, where this coin is even. Over here, Luqman is trying to teach his son a lesson. But even before I get into the next set of verses, let me just remind you of this. What is so unique and so beautiful about this is that when Luqman wants to teach his son a lesson and he wants to remind him of like the right things to do, he doesn't like go in right away, you know? He doesn't scold like his son immediately and tell them like, hey, you should be doing things this way or that way. He takes time. When you want to like mentor someone, when you want to explain something to somebody, oftentimes you have to bring them along so that you know that they're going to be receptive to what it is that you have to say, right? If you go and you ask your manager for a raise, if you go and you ask your teacher, your professor, for a day off on the day of Eid, more likely than not, you're not going to like write in the email, dear professor, like I'm taking off on Wednesday. You're going to be like, hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a nice weekend. Thank you so much for the wonderful semester you've given us. I've learned so much and whatever, right? You fill it with some fluff, right, in the beginning, and then you get to your ask. If you want to ask your manager for some raise, you're going to tell you know, your manager, hey, you know what, this task that I've been working on, it's been really sort of time consuming. And I've been putting forth a lot of effort into it. But you know what, it's so meaningful. You know, in the vision statement of the company line, oh, there is no company like this one, and there's no vision like yours. That being said, I wanted to let you know that you know, uh, inflation is high today, right? And my investments aren't doing so well. So, you know, then you go ahead and you make your ask. Make sense? There's a, there's a process. And over here, Luqman is teaching us a lesson. He's teaching a lesson with regards to how we communicate to someone who would otherwise not be receptive. Okay, let's go back to it. Ya Bunay, oh my beloved son. Innaha in takumitqala habbatan min khardalin. That imagine there was this mustard seed, something insignificant. And it's present in this massive rock. Of samawati, of al ard. Now imagine that this rock, for instance, is in the heavens. Or imagine that this rock is on earth. Or imagine that this seed is in the rock is, is, is in the heavens. Or imagine that this seed is in the earth. Are you going to be able to find it? You can't even find it if it's in your room. You can't even find the remote that's stuck in between the couches. Then over here he states, Even though you would exhaust yourself toward finding this thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the heavens or in the earth in this rock, ya'ti Allah. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows exactly where it is. He knows exactly where it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our God, our Lord, He knows all things. What could Luqman be telling his son? He could be telling him a number of things. Number one is that Allah knows what's in your heart. Allah knows what's in your mind. Allah knows your past mistakes. He knows your past good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that sense of knowledge, that sense of awareness. So don't neglect, don't run away. Appreciate the fact that this Lord who created you when you were so small and when you were so tiny and when you were so insignificant, the day when you came out of the womb of your mother, and the same Lord who hears your du'as in the darkness of night, and the same Lord who sees you struggling with whatever it is that you're struggling with, the same Lord who acknowledges all of these things and he's the same Lord who can also find this mustard seed that is present in a massive rock that's either in the heavens or in the earth. He has that knowledge. Don't run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nowhere else to run except back to him. He states, يَأْتِ بِهَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَطِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ For surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly he is latif. How do we translate? How do you translate Latif? Gracious? Yeah. Right? Graceful. Grace, yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is graceful. That every single precision, every single detail, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He 
has that sense of knowledge and awareness over. Wal khabir, and at the same time, he is all knowledgeable. He continues, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So over here, Luqman, he gives this small example to his son. But realistically, he hasn't actually told him what you should be doing yet, right? First, he begins by saying, you know, worship God. And then he says, and be good to your parents. And then he says, Allah knows all things. Normally, again, when a parent is scolding their child, they get to the scolding eventually at one point or another, right? After all of this that we've been taking a look at for four or five days, after all of this, finally, Luqman, he begins to make the ask. But look at the way that he asks. He continues, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states, Ya Bunayya, aqam salat wa'mur bil ma'ruf, wanha anil munkar, wasbir ala ma asabak, inna dhalika min azm al umur. Only thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and again, oh my dear son, make sure you pray. Can you remember the first time when you were told that you should start to pray? I don't know about you. But most times, for most people, the way that they sort of build a relationship with prayer, someone came to me a little while ago. This is a good example, I think. I think most of my examples are actually pretty good now that I think about it. <laughs> Somebody came to me and said uh, a few months ago, they said, Sheikh, I have like a really, really bad um, like relationship with prayers. So why? They said that when I was younger, I always used to get scolded to pray. So now the way that I'm conditioned when it comes toward my prayers it's like very negative, like I don't enjoy prayers, because I remember those days when I was scolded, you know, and so on and so forth. So I said, are you like still getting scolded today? They said, no. I said, okay, then what's the problem? <laughs> what's the problem? They said, we were conditioned when I was younger, so on and so forth, and I said, okay. Realistically, we, and I, we talked about this a lot, we may have, we may have these unique perceptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of upbringing, on the basis of community. And we complain about them, and we vent at them, and we're able to identify them, and we're able to diagnose why we have this poor relationship with Quran. We're able to diagnose why we have this poor relationship with prayers, or fasting, or the mosque, or the Islamic center, or whatever. Once we've identified it, and once we've stated it time and time and time and time and time and time and time again, what's the next step? If you have a family history of poor cholesterol, okay, there's a good chance that you're also going to have poor cholesterol. Fair? Walking example right here, right? I can complain, oh my God, my family's history, poor cholesterol, it's terrible. My dad has bad cholesterol, my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, I can go up generation after. What are you gonna do? So when the donut's in front of your face, what are you gonna do? What decision are you going to make? It's your decision ultimately at the end of the day. Over here, my friends, it's about shifting our perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we've identified it, once we identified, then we know what it is that we need to break through. So if I know that, for instance, my relationship with prayers, my relationship with Quran, my relationship with religion more broadly was through this incredibly negatively connoted mindset and perspective, great. It's wonderful that we've been able to identify it. Is that a huge problem? It's a huge problem. But going beyond that is the next step then. How do we go beyond it? We start toward building a positive relationship with faith. What do we do? What do we think of cookies in the back all the time, right? Look at that. What, 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 what mosque in the east or the west can you find? Like the, type, the number of sweets that today is less. Today is less. What, the, so, so the last couple of days, Zahra, Zahra, she stepped away. I think we're filled with donuts in the office. Maybe someone can bring them. Yeah. I just want to quickly share my experience. When I was a child and an adolescent, I had a lot of behavioral issues. Um, even the imam, even the sheikh of the masjid that I used to go to told me, hey, you need to, well, not hey, but you should read this dua, Masalim al-Akhlaq, it's gonna help you get better manners. What I had was actually something called lead poisoning. This is actually a disease which a lot of children have, but you can't tell that a child has lead poisoning just by looking at the child. What it causes is behavioral issues. Maybe the child argues a lot of the parents, doesn't listen to the parents. The child is also disruptive in the classroom. The child is also disruptive during Sunday school in the masjid. The child also in general has a lot of trouble focusing in school, doing well in school. 
And this is something, lead poisoning is something that a lot of immigrant parents, that 99% of immigrant parents don't know about. They think that your child just deserves to be slapped or your child just has to put effort into behaving better. Uh, and actually my school would even call my parents to say that your daughter has lead poisoning, you need to get her treated, you need to get her medical treatment. But my parents were new immigrants from India, they were like, lead poisoning, what is that? She doesn't look sick, she just has bad manners, you know, behavioral issues. Now you all are grown up, but if you have nephews or nieces, you know, younger, pe you know, younger kids in your family, who are, or extended family who have behavioral issues, tell their parents that there is something called lead poisoning that a lot of kids are severely affected by that also affect how well the kids do in school and they need to get a lead test, a lead blood test for their kids. And this is a treatable condition. They have to follow up with that treatment. That's really important. Instead of just telling the kids to, to read duas to make them you know, better kids, it's also important to get them this uh, treatment, chelation treatment for the lead poisoning that they have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you know about this? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Inshallah, we can we can work towards doing that. Um, so coming back to the verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says, "Ya Bunaya, inna ha anta kumat qala habbatan min khardalin fatakun fi sakhratin, aw fi samawati, aw fi al-ardi yati bi Allah. Inna Allah la tifun khabir." After Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives this example about this atom, this sort of seed that is present in this boulder that might be in the heavens or that might be on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come toward defining and demonstrating to you exactly where it is. Again, perhaps in a way toward demonstrating the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jalla. In the next verse he says, Ya Bunay, aqim is salat. Oh my dear son, now to ask, you should establish prayer. Again, it's positively connoted. There's a relationship now that he's starting to be aware of. It breaks him in a certain way where he's able to recognize again the incredible nuance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today. We saw this eclipse ahead, you know, on, on, uh, above, uh, above, above our heads in the heavens. And again, the uniqueness and the beauty, right? And also the fear. It looked, looked like out of a movie, you know, in some ways. Over here, we're able to demonstrate and we're able to see the power and the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why we're obligated to perform this prayer. We perform salatul ayat, this prayer of the sign. That is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that is unique something that we don't see every day, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do during the course of this prayer that it is that we're performing, again, is showing a, 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 a sort of ritual of submission, an absolute servitude in front of the Lord of the worlds. That oh, Allah, that I think that I'm in control, I'm not in control. I'm not in control. And a few days ago, we had an earthquake, and we also were obligated to perform the same prayer. These are, again, out of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we are demonstrating to the Lord of the world that I am not in control. You have knowledge of all things. I have no idea what might happen tomorrow. I can predict and I can plan, but at the end of the day, my predictions and my plans, they're truly not in my hands. It's in the hands of Allah, uh, Azza wa Jal. Over here, he, then he states again, Ya Bunay, aqam is salat. Establish your prayer. Make sure you pray. Wa'mur bil ma'aruf. And enjoin the good. Encourage others to do good as well. And forbid the evil. When some others are doing wrong, then you encourage them as well to stay away from wrongdoing. And be patient over any difficulties and misfortunes that you might go through. Finally, and he says, surely that is like the right uh, uh, path. Over here, finally, Luqman, he finally begins to speak toward these advices that any father would naturally give their son. Be good, hang out with the good people, stay away from the bad people, virtually, right, in our language, you know, keep a good company, make sure you keep up with your prayers, do the right thing. That's virtually what Luqman is saying. Nothing more than that. But again, it's about the style and the technique and the way that he engages with his son. The examples that he gives in order to curate that relationship such that he sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sense of positivity not with a sense of negativity, such that he's able to appreciate the fact that this Lord, he truly is knowledge about, uh, knowledgeable about all things. Why would I sit here and deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then in the next set of verses, Luqman alayhi salam, he begins to continue with other pieces of advice. He says, وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ We can take a look at these next two verses 
uh, after the month of Ramadan in our Thursday programs. But let me just conclude with these last a couple of quick reminders, particularly as we are in the final eve of the holy month of Ramadan. One important takeaway that we gain from these advices of Luqman to his son is about the importance again of <coughs> building out this sense of meaningful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it starts by engaging in sort of a system of self-diagnosis with regards to how we feel today, on this eve, on this night, which again, like we said, is likely the last night of the month of Ramadan. How do people feel? Do we feel a sense of like excitement that we're looking forward to the conclusion of the month of Ramadan? Or on the flip side, do we feel upset? Is it difficult to part ways with this sacred month? At the end of the day, if we feel really excited, what are we feeling excited about? Do we feel excited that we benefited from this month of Ramadan and now we have the opportunity to look forward toward all of the tools that we gain throughout the course of this month such that we're able to apply them throughout the course of the year and throughout the course of our lives? Or are we looking forward to the fact that like, the burden of the month of Ramadan has been lifted? These are things that we should be thinking about individually. And I wanted to share some reminders, as Sheikh Muntadar also reminded me, from dua, from the dua of Imam Ali ibn Hussein, Zain al-Abideen, alayhi salatu was salam, as he speaks to this bidding of farewell uh, of the holy month of Ramadan, as he mentions within as sahifat as sajadiya dua number 35. The Imam, alayhi salatu was salam, he states, I want to share a couple of lines such that we're able to take benefit. He states, Ya Shahrullah al Akbar, wa ya Eid Awliya'ah. O the greatest month of Allah, and O the festival of the friends of Allah. Assalamu alaik, ya Akrama Maskhubin min al Awqat. Peace be upon you, for you are the best of friends in all of time. Listen to the way that he addresses this month of Ramadan. Wa ya khayra shahrin fi ayami wa sa'at. And you are the best of months. In its days and hours, there is nothing that compares to you. As-salamu alayk min shahrin qarubat fihi al-amal. You know, when we gathered together on the night of Laylat al-Qadr, and we made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever we make dua during the course of this month of Ramadan, for whatever it is that we ask, whatever, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins, to make you more wealthy, to get you married, to get you have children, to whatever it is, whatever dua that you make. When we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the month of Ramadan, we have absolute certainty that that dua is going to be answered. And we should, because we feel it close. We can... We, we feel this love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompass our heart. He states, And peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan, for you are the month which brought forth all of our hopes really clear and very, very close to us. We saw all of these du'as that we had materializing in front of us, even if Allah chooses not to respond to them. We believe with certainty He will respond to them. وَنَشُرَتْ فِيهِ الْأَعْمَالِ and peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan, where we engaged in all of these actions and all of these rituals in recitation of Quran and in dua and in supplication and in additional prayers. As-salamu alayk min qareenin jalla qadruhu mawjuda. Peace be upon you, O friend, who, when I found you, all my problems went away. Who, when I found you, O month of Ramadan, there is no comparison to you. And when you leave us, it torments my heart. These are the words of Ali ibn Hussein Zain al-Abidin. When the month of Ramadan was leaving, the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them, their hearts would be shattered, they would be broken, they would be so overwhelmed with emotion. And that this friend that I was looking forward to being in the company of, when it parts ways, breaks my heart. You know, 
when you look forward to seeing someone after a long time, some fa- friend, some family member, you're looking forward to that day when you're going to be able to meet them again, when you're going to be able to see them again. Or even worse, when you lose someone that you love. This is the example that Imam Zainal Abidin gives. When you lose someone, somebody passes away. How many people, how many of us lost someone just in the last several months? So many people have been making du'a for them. To lose somebody, that first moment when you hear that your loved one has just passed away, you can't feel your body, you can't feel your limbs, you think it's impossible, you don't know how you're ever going to recover from it. Over here, the Imam alayhi salam is saying that it's as if that the month of Ramadan is like this friend of mine that I just lost on these days as we conclude this holy month of Ramadan. As-salamu alayk min ali fi anasa muqbilan fasarra That peace be upon you whenever you would come. When the month of Ramadan is approaching, I would be comforted and I would look forward to those days. I would get so excited thinking about that moment. Wa mun Adiyan famadda. And when you left, you left us lonely. And you left us in pain. As-salamu alayk min mujawarin raqqat fihi al-qulub wa qallat fihi al And peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan. For when you were our neighbor, our hearts became soft. And all of our sins, they began to fall off. As-salamu alayk min nasari a'ana ala shaytan and peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan. For you helped us against the whisperings of shaitan. وَصَاهِبٍ sahala subul al ihsan And peace be upon you, for you were a good friend who made our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very easy. As-salamu alayk ma ektara utaqa Allah fiq. Peace be upon you. Because of you, so many of us were freed from the shackles of punishment. وَمَا أَسْأَدَ مَنْ رَآ حُرْمَتَكَ Bik, and how happy are those who engaged in this month? How happy were they? What, what were they when they benefited from your sacredness? Just a few more, and we'll conclude. As-salamu alayk, ma kana amhaka lidunub. Peace be upon you, a month of Ramadan. For you are that which helped erase all of my sins. Was taraka li anwa al ayub, and you are the one who helped me cover all of my faults. As-salamu alayk, ma kana aqwalaka ala al-mujrimin. Listen to this. He states, Oh, then peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan, for how long you were, how long you were in duration for the sinners. For the sinners, for someone who does not enjoy being in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they just count down the days, how many more days. You know, I'll say this with love, I'm always positive. I always talk about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You all know this for those of you who sit in my programs. You know what is so sad and embarrassing? When people like have like these things that they put like online or even in their homes and their social media, where they're literally looking forward to counting down the days to the end of the month of Ramadan. Really, I get it, you know, in some ways to encourage children to celebrate the day of Eid. And if that's the intention, then great. But if we are literally counting down the days, alhamdulillah, we're, you know, 90% complete. This is amazing. You know, we've almost done it. Yeah, fine, in some ways, we don't judge people's intentions. But generally, that type of culture, that type of culture and that type of language, what does it do in terms of us building out this positive relationship with the month of Ramadan? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any- we only see it as a sense of burden. Like we talked about uh, so many nights ago, that when we're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayers, when we're making this dua, Right? We can either see it as a burden or we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us for this responsibility. He didn't ask the animals that roam this earth. He didn't even ask the angels and the dwellers of paradise. He didn't say that you have to fast during the month of Ramadan. He chose the human being to do that. He states, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ That the angels, they ask permission to be a participant on the night of Qadr. And Allah does not grant it to them except with His permission. We're honored. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us this blessing. He's placed upon us this burden of responsibility. That's because we can bear it. And that's something beautiful. Not something negative. He states, Salamu alayhi, As-salamu alayk. Ma kana atawalaka ala al-mujrimin. How long were you? You took forever. For those who didn't appreciate the mercy and the grace that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had brought upon us. What? What? 
things to do in Mu'minin, and how incredible you were. How incredible you were for the believers. For those who don't believe, we won't worry about them. But for us, what did it do for us? The ability that it has this holy month of Ramadan to totally transform us. We look forward to that. Assalamu alaykum. Min shahrin la tuna fistuhul ayyam. And peace be upon you, O month of Ramadan, which no days compete with your days. Assalamu alaykum. Min shahrin huwa min kulli amrin salam. Peace be upon you for every moment during your days of, month, of the sacred month are moments of peace. Assalamu alaykum. Ghayra karihil musahaba. Peace be upon you. For you as a friend, we never disliked it. We always look forward to your company. There's some of our friends, we don't necessarily look forward to their company, right? But for the month of Ramadan, we always look forward to their company. Wala dhamim al And peace be upon you. That everyone would enjoy and be present in this month benefiting from you. Assalamu alaykum. Kama and peace be upon you. In the same way, you had entered upon us with so much blessing. And in the same way that you purified our hearts and our souls from, this, uh, from, from all of our own sins and our own transgressions, and also do that at this month's heart. I conclude with this. Over here, in this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this whole Quran that we've been taking a look at, in depth for the last couple of weeks. And in these words of Ali Zain al-Abideen alayhi salatu wasalam, we come to this conclusion. Again, don't answer the question. We answer it internally within ourselves and then we work. If we are someone who looks forward to the conclusion of the month of Ramadan because we know that it's given us the tools to be successful beyond the month of Ramadan, then paradise is for us and all of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are with us. And if we are upset that this month is passing because we'll miss being in communication with the Lord of the world in the darkness of night, there are no nights like these and there are no days like these, then also paradise is for us, inshallah. But at the same time, know that just because it's ending, there's also a new beginning. Just like this month is concluding, there's also a new opportunity. We mentioned on the nights of Laylat al-Qadr that everything in this world is temporary. And we accept that. Even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the verses of paradise, we compare them toward the pleasures that we enjoin within this dunya, and every single one of them, they pass by very quickly. The food that we eat, the company that we're in, the sleep that we're sleeping, the money that we make, it's all something that is transitory in some way and in some capacity. But this pleasure that we enjoy in communication and in dua and in supplication with the Lord of the worlds. When you find God, and when you communicate to God in the way that we do, with sincerity and with love and with devotion, there's no moment nor any experiences like that. And know that just because you did it during the month of Ramadan, that means you could also do it beyond the month of Ramadan. All it takes is a little bit more effort than you would put in during the course of this month. All it takes is a little bit more diligence. All it takes is a little bit more focus. Tonight, we don't see this month of Ramadan as an end, as much as a new beginning and as a new opportunity. And we tell ourselves with full sincerity, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and support us, because we oftentimes tell ourselves that, ah, Ramadan is over, I'm done. There's no way I can continue this. You can continue it. You can. You did it for 30 days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far more gracious and he's far more kind, and he's far more loving, and he's far more merciful than you could have ever imagined. Ask Allah to help you. Ask Allah to help all of us, such that we are able to live a life that is devoted to the submissiveness and servitude of the Lord of the worlds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this last night of the holy month of Ramadan to accept our fasting during the day and our prayers during the night. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our loves, our heart with his love, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a life that resembles the life of Muhammad and wa'ali Muhammad and a death that resembles the death of Muhammad and wa'ali Muhammad. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahum ala Muhammad wa ala al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Wa rahimallah man qara'a suratul fatiha.
مسبوقه بالصلاه على محمد وال محمد. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد.